Hello and welcome to our annual proxy season lessons learned. Uh, I'm Mark Trevino. I'm joining Melissa Sawyer, the head of our M&A practice, and uh, and with whom I co-head the corporate practice, and Jun Yu, whose practice focuses on sustainability and on corporate governance. Um, we look forward to discussing this past season and the next with you. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, we try, I'll try to address them either during our presentation or at the end. And if we're unable to, we'll try to get back to you afterwards. There's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And you can, um, you can use that to ask questions. Um, the 2022 proxy season marked the 10th anniversary of our annual proxy season review. Uh, for those of you who don't keep them handy the way I do. Um, the 2012 edition was 25 pages long, 10 of which were devoted to the independent chair special meeting and written consent proposals. And one page was devoted to environmental, social, and political proposals, noting that no such proposals passed in 2012. Um, fast forward to um, 2022. Uh, which was a record year for shareholder proposals. Uh, almost 250 more than 10 years ago. Our proxy season review is three times as long with 75 pages over two parts, um, but we devote only a measly average of one page per each of the big three governance proposals. Uh, you know what happened. Um, what happened was almost all of the increase in shareholder proposals over this past decade was environmental, social, and political as opposed to governance proposals. Um, this year, they represent almost two thirds of proposals submitted after reaching a majority just last year for the first time. Um, this was driven by an almost 40% year over year increase in environmental proposals, as you can see, and an almost 20% increase in social um, and political pro proposals. It's with this background that we're going to be looking forward um, to next year. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to let us uh, just guide us as to what we're talking about. Thanks, Mark. Well, clearly, we're going to be talking about all these shareholder proposals. But before we dive into the data, we need to spend a few minutes talking about SEC rulemaking, because so much of what we've been seeing over the last year has been informed by, or in some cases, even driven by what the SEC has been doing, um, which is a lot. They've been super busy. And that will also, I think, help us to make some predictions about some things that we might start to see in 2023, because that rulemaking effort continues. And by all accounts, we should expect to see some further changes in rulemaking this fall. Um, we also every year try to get to a brief discussion of say on pay um, and related issues at the end of this webinar, and we almost never leave enough time for it. So what I would say is that if that's an area of interest to you, if you have questions, Mark is your guy and you should absolutely reach out to him. He's the leading expert on that topic in the world. And so if we don't get to it today, we'll apologize and you will have access to him offline. So with that, let me turn it over to June um, and Mark to talk about some of these SEC developments that have been so important. Thanks, Melissa. I'll start with um, a development that occurred in November of last year when the SEC released its new staff legal bulletin, SLB 14L, which had a significant impact on the submission and voting trends during the 2022 proxy season. SLB 14L reversed prior SEC guidance and altered the, uh, the staff's approach with respect to the ordinary business and economic relevance exclusions. Under the new guidance, instead of focusing on a particular proposal's significance to the specific company and its operations, the staff assesses whether a proposal raises issues with a broad societal impact in determining whether a proposal is excludable on the basis of ordinary business. Similarly, proposals that relate to operations below the economic thresholds under the economic relevance exclusion may no longer be excluded if they raise issues of broad societal or ethical 
concern related to the company's business. As the table on the slide shows, the staff's new approach correlated with a significant decrease in the likelihood of companies obtaining no action relief since the passing of SLB 14L, since the release of SLB 14L, I should say. In particular, the success rate for no action requests decreased by almost 50% on social and political shareholder proposal. Not only were companies less likely to obtain no action relief, proponents were less incentivized to negotiate settlements with companies. For example, whereas social proposals used to be the most likely to be withdrawn, usually following company proponent engagement in advance of a vote, we observed that proponents were 1.3 times less likely to withdraw social and political proposals this year. Institutional investors such as T. Rowe Price have also remarked that proponents were more hesitant to engage with companies on these types of proposals. As a result, shareholder proposals made it to a vote much more frequently in the 2022 proxy season. For the first time in a decade, we observed that a majority of environmental, social, and political uh, proposals submitted reached a vote. In fact, voted social and political proposals increased by 72% over the same period in 2021. However, despite a significant increase in shareholder proposals voted on, the number of passing proposals actually decreased. Shareholder support for social, environmental, and political proposals decreased in 2022 after steadily rising throughout the last decade, reaching a five-year low of 28%. Um, in part, the lower support this year reflects shareholders' frustration with lower quality or non-company specific proposals, which tended to be excluded or settled prior to a vote in past years. Besides making it harder for companies to resolve proposals in advance of their shareholder meetings, we expect proponents to continue to submit more prescriptive and granular proposals in the upcoming proxy season. For example, institutional investors such as BlackRock have noted that they voted on more prescriptive climate-related proposals this year, including those that seek specific timeframes or methods for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We expect this trend to continue partly because SLB 14L specifically states that proposals seeking detail or seeking to promote timeframes or methods do not per se constitute excludable micromanagement. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Mark, do you have any other predictions on the SEC's impact for the future proxy seasons? Um, uh, I think our continuing theme for our session today is going to be more to come. Um, and that's what you can expect in 2023. Whatever your impression of 2022 was, you should just turbocharge it. Um, if we look at the SEC's agenda, um, here, just a couple of months ago, the SEC proposed additional amendments to 14A8 um, that would narrow the ability to exclude shareholder proposals from proxy statements, this time on the basis of substantial implementation, duplication, or resubmission. Uh, I think that, you know, there were rules, newer thresholds just adopted in 2020, which were designed to, to limit and focus shareholder proposals. Um, the new change would not only moot that, which I think very few people thought had impact over the past um, season, um, but they invite more granular proposals, multiple proposals on the same topic, proposals year over year. Um, it remains to be seen, I think, how much of an effect the rule change could have for 2023 or whether it's a 2024 item. But this SEC is more difficult to predict than the prior one. Um, not even on here is the pay versus performance rule adoption, uh, which just came out and will be effective for the next season. Um, one thing we do know that's going to be effective for the next season is universal proxy. So issuers should keep their eye on that. Um, we've warned you over the past, I think, two or three years to make sure that um, your bylaws work and to get ready for increased focus um, on director qualifications. I think um, director qualifications is another item 
that uh, the SEC rulemaking continues to work into a froth. Um, so they'll, you know, you can expect greater scrutiny of qualifications along uh, ESP lines with respect to cybersecurity and climate um, as those rules are adopted and require greater disclosure around that. Um, according to the fall agenda, the commission uh, is still expecting to release human capital management disclosure requirements. We saw uh, increased disclosure again over the past two or three years. Um, if that if that that agenda is aspirational, but if you took it at its word, that would be an October item. Um, there have been lots of uh, previews from the chair um, and the other commissioners uh, with respect to what that might entail. Might include workforce turnover, skills and development training, and expenses some facts around compensation and benefits for the rank and file changes over time and workforce demographics, um, including potentially uh, not only EEO1 data, but also health and safety type disclosure um, as well. Uh, the fall agenda also contains um, enhanced disclosure about diversity of board members, uh, which uh, at least even the aspirational agenda doesn't put that uh, as a this year item. So that's a next year item. Um, but look, these all serve as a roadmap against which pro-disclosure investors um, are likely to, to evaluate compliance even on a voluntary basis at this point. So, so that's what's happening. It's just more, more, more. Um, and then although not an SEC development, before we get into shareholder proposals, we have to keep an eye on um, exculpation of officers, which Delaware now permits for the first time to take advantage of this change as an existing public issue where you're going to need to amend your certificate of incorporation, which everyone knows requires a shareholder vote, but also requires a preliminary proxy. Um, it is, um, it's not clear at this time exactly how this is going to develop for this season. Uh, although I'm hopeful that There'll be a number of issuers that move forward with this because I think it is helpful um, for issuers and their shareholder base to get this behind them. Um, but if you're thinking about it, even if you're not thinking about it, I would build time into your proxy process this year for a preliminary in case this is something that uh, your management or board decides late in the day that they would like to adopt this year. And so build in time, be ready with an amendment if you elect to take that course. Um, so with that warning, let's look at uh, shareholder proposals. Melissa, I think you were gonna start us off on that. Yeah, let me start with the headline, which Mark previewed, but these are increasing fast and furious uh, 1488 proposals. When I started my career at Sullivan and Cromwell 22 years ago, we used to call shareholder proponents gadflies, and they would show up at shareholder meetings with proposals for things like um, better food in the company cafeteria. That was an actual 1488 proposal made at Ford Motor Company at one point. Um, the sophistication of proponents has increased. The number of proposals has exploded. And we break proposals down into four categories. Um, we look at them as social political proposals, governance proposals, environmental proposals, and com compensation proposals. This is a little bit subjective. Obviously, there are proposals that can cross the line between environmental and social, for example. So we do have to exercise some judgment as we go through this process. I also, just to answer a question that we got in the Q&A, um, want to say that we look at information that is publicly available. So we look at what issuers disclose in their proxy statements, and we look at submissions that are made to the SEC in terms of no action requests and withdrawals. Um, we do not measure um, proposals that are submitted to companies that are not published either by the company or through the SEC no action letter process. There are some proponents who um, list withdrawals on their websites, for example, but that information is a little bit anecdotal and varies from proponent to proponent. And so that's a little bit harder for us to use in our data set. Um, so we may actually be underreporting the number of touch points that companies have with proponents, um, but that's a necessary byproduct of trying to be a little bit more rigorous with the data that we use. Um, 
But in any event, the, um, the, the growth of shareholder proposals is evidenced by the numbers even for our data set. Social political proposals increased 17% year over year. Environmental proposals were up a whopping 38%. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes, but that's an area where we're probably going to see continued growth. Governance proposals, in contrast, have gone down, and um, they've also become kind of routine. Um, so about half of those governance proposals related to the single topic of amending special meeting thresholds. And as we'll talk about, a lot of those are coming from the same small group of proponents. So they look very similar to come from company to company as well. Um, these shareholder proposals, um, instead of talking about food in the cafeteria, are now often um, tackling topics that have real important ties to the broader socio-political landscape. Um, they're really a mirror of trends that we're seeing play out in the electoral landscape, for example, and they have implications for things like company brand equity, employee retention, customer retention, um, as well as how uh, companies relate to governing bodies. And um, that's, that's a theme that will play out a lot in some of the discussion that we're going to have. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about social and political proposals. Um, and as I said, we've su we've seen big growth in this um, category and in a subset of this category in particular. So civil rights, human rights, and racial equity impact related proposals went up 81%. So that has clearly been an area of focus for proponents. Um, and we can just go right to the next slide because I want to talk about the distinction between racial equity audit proposals and civil rights audit proposals. Um, they have some things in common, but I think if you think of it as a Venn diagram, the racial equity pro audit proposals are sort of the small circle that sits within the much larger circle of civil rights audit proposals, which cover not just racial equity issues, but also touch on things like gender equality, pay equity, and human rights impacts. Big growth in all of these categories, and in both categories, the SEC rejected every single no action request that was submitted. So the story here is that if you get one of these proposals, you should plan to either have it voted or you're gonna need to negotiate a withdrawal, but you're not gonna get the SEC in all likelihood to give you no action relief to exclude the proposal from your proxy statement. We did see some relatively high rates of withdrawal on the racial equity audit proposals from companies that did agree to perform some form of the audit. Um, but equally, many of them were voted on and shareholder support varied across a wide range, all the way from 18% to 64%. So we saw three of those proposals actually pass. In the civil rights audit proposal category, um, we also saw some of what we call anti-ESG proposals um, from proponents, for example, seeking reports about topics like ideological diversity on boards. Um, again, we saw variability in how many of these passed. Um, we saw four pass with the highest support level being 62% for the civil rights audit proposals. Um, if we go to the next slide, another category of social political proposals are human capital management related proposals. And in prior years, this category was largely um, taken up by DEI related proposals. Um, this year, we saw a lot more specific proposals around things like um, sort of workplace characteristics, har harassment, um, inadequate paid sick leave, employee health and safety issues. A lot of these proposals, I think thematically tied to um, stories that were playing out in the media more generally around unionization at warehouses and things like that. Um, and there were quite a few proposals relating to um, the use of concealment clauses, which um, we heard about in the last presidential election and have become a topic that has drawn quite a lot of focus as well. 
we did also start to see some proposals related to reproductive rights um, a little bit in the wake of the Dobbs decision. Um, and I think that that is probably a precursor to a theme that we'll see more of in 2023 with companies receiving proposals, asking them to report on how they're handling those issues um, and how they how they sort of tie that to their, their business um, purposes. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to, um, I think Mark is going to talk about political spending. And Mark's on mute. I also said, yes, yes, I am, which was even better. Uh, so yes, I'm going to talk about yes, I'm going to talk about political spending a little bit compared to the other categories in ESP, political proposals have had the greatest level of year-over-year -year consistency, both in terms of total numbers, in focal issues, in target companies, uh, in result, in each case over the last um, decade, uh, following the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision, and focusing on transparent disclosure, of political spending, and, and lobbying. This year, um, there were 20 new ESP-linked political proposals, um, which asked companies to assess alignment between their stated company values and their political spending. Um, these new congruency proposals um, typically contrast the public company statements in support of, for example, reproductive rights or climate change with records on political contributions to candidates who might um, oppose these efforts. Uh, companies settled many of these, um, but 10 went to a vote um, and received relatively high support between 30 and 50%. Um, I think in the coming year, uh, I would expect to see an increase in these proposals and perhaps also in, in their granularity or targeting. Uh, I think that proponents on both sides of the Dobbs debate um, are likely to make congruency proposals related to reproductive rights um, a focal point uh, for this year. Um, an exception to the general story on the success or relatively su success of congruency proposals was a proposal by the National Center for Public Policy Research at Pfizer, um, which received only 10%. Um, and that was an example of the increase in anti-ESG uh, proposals this year. Um, the NCPPR continued to be one of the most prolific so-called anti-ESG proponents. And for this purpose, we have, um, we have, we use that with respect to any entities that are identified um, as expressing concerns with commonly used environmental, social, and governance investment criteria. Um, and as I said, we saw um, a more than doubling of so-called anti-ESG proposals in the past season um, from 25 to 54. And I think this is a function of how, unfortunately for our public companies, the annual meeting process has become one for dialogue between shareholders on, on issues that may only tangentially relate uh, to the company. And you see this, um, you see this repeatedly. Um, in addition to the NC uh, PPR, we have the National League Legal, National Legal and Policy Center, um, which submitted a meeting number of proposals for the first time this year, including around um, ideological board diversity and the use of child labor in electric vehicles. Um, and with the rise and change in, in these proposals, you saw for the first time this year the significance that a proponent's policy agenda can have to a voting outcome, even if the proposal itself on its face um, is relatively um, neutral. So for example, of the 17 civil rights audit proposals that were submitted, nine were brought by the NCPPR. Um, shareholder support for the pro ESP proponents ranged um, up to almost 62%, while um, 
the NCPPR's civil rights proposals were very similar. Um, but they did note that they didn't want companies to compound the error um, with bias relying by relying only on left-leaning organizations. Um, and that support, which looked on its face very similar, I think capped out at a high of 4%. Uh, and you saw at, at one company, very similar proposals, a racial equity proposal by a, a pro ESP proponent and a civil rights audit proposal by the NCPPR. Um, and those proponents had a difference in outcome of uh, 60%. Um, for institutional investors, I think it was a difficult time this year distinguishing these proposals um, and understanding in some cases that the message they might send by supporting a proposal that was facially neutral could be different because of the policy agenda of the proponent. Uh, and so as you enter the new season, I think it is important to keep that in mind and make it easy for your investors to understand who is proposing if it is meaningful uh, to them. Um, I think uh, just as an, as an aside, uh, companies were also much more successful in excluding anti-ESG proposals, including on ordinary business grounds with the SEC, um, than with respect to the normal pro-ESG proposals. Uh, I don't know that we necessarily think that that's the right policy outcome, but it's something that you should be aware as you look at new proposals and are thinking about whether even with um, even with a lower likelihood of success, you might want to put in a no action letter. Um, I think it's time uh, to turn to the next largest category of proposals. I think that's, um, I think that's governance. Thanks, Mark. Um, so as we previewed earlier, governance is not probably the most exciting category anymore, given all the activity around ESG, but we can't disregard it completely because the governance proponents have become very sophisticated about how they submit these proposals. Um, we don't see the um, staff legal bulletin 14L having a big impact on this category because it was fairly rare for proponents to seek no action relief for governance proposals on the basis of the ordinary business exclusion. Instead, what was more common was to seek exclusion on the basis that the proposal had already been substantially implemented by the issuer, or on the basis that there was a conflicting management proposal. And historically, some issuers were able to rely on those exclusions, even if what the company had done was slightly different than what the proponent was asking for. So just by way of example, um, in the world of proxy access, it had been the case in the past that if the proponent was asking for a different group limit, than what the company had already implemented in their form of proxy access, it might still be possible to get that proposal excluded on the basis of substantial implementation. Um, what we've been seeing lately is that the SEC is less likely to permit exclusion when there are distinct differences between what the proponent is asking for and what the company has already done. Um, this played out for example, in relation to special meeting and written consent proposals, where if the proponent was asking for a different threshold than what the company had already done, we ended up seeing scenarios where there were side-by-side -side votes, one vote on a management proposal for management's preferred threshold, and one vote on the proponent's um, threshold at the same meeting. Um, a lot of these proposals end up going to a vote because of the challenges in getting them excluded through the SEC no action process. And we kind of break down governance proposals into a couple different categories. One category are these structural proposals that encompass special meetings, written consent, and proxy access. They usually seek changes to an issuer's bylaws to implement them. The other category that we see proposals in are board composition-related proposals, 
um, often um, looking for things like board diversity, for example, or articulating particular skill sets that are needed on the board. One thing to point out on the board composition front is that we have become aware that the SEC may be taking an interest in this category as well um, and asking issuers to enhance their proxy disclosures around some of these topics. Um, so this could be something that um, sort of interacts with what happens in 2023 in terms of 14A8 proposals. There could be some intersection between what the SEC is asking for on the disclosure front and what we had historically seen come through the 14A8 process. If we go to the next slide, I just want to spend a minute on special meeting thresholds because um, this was the largest category of structural governance proposals. We saw a flurry of proposals seeking to lower the threshold of ownership needed for shareholders to call a special meeting. Um, and most of these proposals were seeking amendments to existing special meeting rights rather than asking for new special meeting rights at companies that didn't previously have them. Um, the companies that were successful in having these special meeting proposals voted down um, were ones for the most part that were able to demonstrate that the requested threshold that the proponent was seeking would essentially give too much power to a single shareholder or to a couple of large holders to call special meetings that may not be in the interests of the broader shareholder base. So if you're a company that has a couple of very large shareholders, 10% or greater, and somebody's seeking a special meeting threshold to be set at 10%, one argument that appears to have been persuasive both with ISS and with large institutional holders is the argument that setting the threshold that low would allow a single shareholder to call a special meeting whether or not other holders were supportive of that. Um, and ISS seemed to find that argument compelling as well, um, as we can see from the data that, that shows that they recommended against some of those lower percentage um, thresholds in those cases. So I think that's enough on governance for this year, given that this was not the hot topic. And we should move on now to what was a hot topic, which is environmental proposals. And I'll turn it over to June for that. Thanks, Melissa. As Mark and Melissa have already previewed, there has been a steady increase in the number of uh, environmental proposals over the last decade, but it really in exploded in 2021 and 2022. Um, in 2021, we saw a 40% year over year increase in the number of environmental proposals. And as Melissa already previewed this year, we saw a further 38% year over year increase. As you saw in Green Century Capital Management were the most prolific environmental proponents in 2022 and submitted 45% of all environmental proposals. However, we also saw groups like Sierra Club um, being active in submitting a number of environmental proposals this year. And I think this had some impact on the engagement companies had with proponents in 2022. In prior years, companies and proponents often settled rather than taking an environmental proposal to a vote. Um, whereas half of the environmental proposals were withdrawn before a vote in the first half of 2021, proponents were much less willing to settle in 2022. Um, as a result of proponents' greater reluctance to settle and a 30% decrease in no action success, 78% more environmental proposals reached a shareholder vote compared to 2021. Here I'll, I'll note perhaps the most notable trend we observed in the 2022 proxy season on environmental proposals, and that was how granular the proposals were. Even in 2021, we saw proponents make more broad and general requests, like publishing, for example, a sustainability report, and then only making granular demands in response to company-specific issues or controversies. However, in 2022, 
companies have been receiving these more technical, more specific, more granular proposals across the board. Um, for example, some of the 2022 proposals broke down prior proposals into discrete subparts. So instead of requesting broad climate impact policies or commitments, demanding that companies limit their investments and in lending activities in carbon in in intensive sectors. Some specified more detailed standards, for example, instead of you know, generally aligning with the Paris Agreement's goals, setting independently verified science-based targets for particular scopes of GHG emissions. Others prescribe specific means for achieving a previously requested underlying objective. For example, instead of asking for risk oversight enhancement generally with respect to climate, requiring companies to conduct a scenario analysis. Correlated with this increase in granularity, the 2022 environmental proposals received lower levels of support overall. Institutional investors voice their concern that proponents may be taking a one-size-fits-all approach without fully considering the context in which companies are operating their businesses. For example, citing granular proposals on climate, BlackRock announced it supported 24% of environmental proposals in 2022 compared to 43% in, uh, sorry, in 2021 compared to 43 in 2022 and noted that many climate-related shareholder proposals sought to dictate the pace of companies' energy transition plans despite a continued consumer demand, with little regard to company financial performance, and other proposals failed to recognize that companies had largely already met their ask. I'll give you a few concrete examples of the new types of environmental proposals we saw in 2022, which we think companies will continue to see in 2023. And one of the main ones was climate-related targets. So in 2021, um, with limited exceptions, proposals on climate-related targets focused on alignment with the Paris Agreement, generally looking at a long-term horizon. A quarter of the 2021 climate target proposals went to a vote, and all but one passed. In 2022, proponents submitted a much higher number of climate target proposals, many of which were more specific. Around 40% of these proposals requested the adoption of some combination of short, medium, and long-term science-based targets for scope three emissions, with a few of these proposals going so far as to request targets for specific subcategories of scope three. None of these more specific proposals passed. Um, and the climate target proposals that did pass mostly included the broader Paris Agreement proposals, which give companies comparatively more freedom to define their own targets and horizons, as well as a request for a company to disclose progress against its previously announced target. Overall, although climate target proposals continue to be settled at high rate, the likelihood of re reaching a settlement with proponents decreased in 2022. Both companies and proponents seem to have been more reluctant to settle, actually. Companies may not want to adopt a climate target this year, especially a scope three target, in light of the SEC's proposed climate-related disclosure rules. Um, even though these rules would not require companies to set a scope three target, once a company sets a target uh, on scope three, not only would it have to provide detailed disclosures on that target, but it will also trigger the requirement to calculate and disclose scope three emissions, even if um, scope three emissions are not material to that company. Um, we also saw that proponents are staying focused on the role that financial institutions play in climate change. In 2021, five banks received proposals from As You So requesting them to disclose their plans reduce finance greenhouse gas emissions. In 2022, six plant banks, including the same five from 2021 and three insurance companies, received a total of 15 proposals relating to their lending activities. And 12 of, the, 12 of these 15 proposals asked the financial institutions to adopt lending or underwriting policies that align 
with the greenhouse reduction, greenhouse gas reduction path outlined in the International Energy Agency's zero emissions by 2050 scenario, which is meant to be consistent with limiting global temperature rise to a 1.5 degree increase without a temperature overshoot. Um, and specifically under these proposals, the proponents asked the financial institutions to limit or end financing of new fossil fuel supplies. Whereas um, the climate related financing proposals were settled between, all of them were settled between proponents and companies in 2021. This year, it was the opposite. All of the um, IEA related proposals went to a vote, although none received more than 20% of votes cast. The only financing activity proposal that passed in uh, 2022 was a broader request for voluntary reporting on efforts to measure and reduce underwriting related emissions at an insurance company, which received 56% of votes cast. Again, companies may also have been reluctant to settle these proposals since states like West Virginia and Texas have enacted laws that prohibit state pension funds from investing in um, financial institute that boycott fossil fuel financing. And the last category of environmental proposals I wanna highlight is climate related lobbying proposals, um, which companies saw in 20, 2021 and 2022, and which we expect to continue to see in 2023, especially given their success in recent years. For the last two years, investors have requested disclosures on the alignment between companies' lobbying activities, including through, through trade associations and nonprofits, and the Paris Agreement goals, focusing on companies that have already announced a commitment to these goals. I think Mark talked about it, the, the increasing granularity of these political um, congruency proposals. And we're really seeing it um, this year in terms of the climate related arena. In you know, 2022, companies received 16 of these environmental congruency proposals. Um, and while last year, all of these proposals went to a vote and only one failed to gain majority wow. support. Um, due to the success of these proposals in 2021, uh, only three went to a vote with companies more willing to settle in 2022 than they were in 2021. So here, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to talk about his predictions for environmental proposals next year. And before you do that, Mark, let me just pause on a housekeeping, folks. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer during or after the program, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A. All right, Mark, give us your predictions for 2023 on environmental. Well, now that everyone has their pads and pen out, it's like super easy for you to uh, to write this down. Look, um, there's some obvious ones. And the first is it's going to become even more difficult for companies to negotiate a compromise or to exclude environmental shareholder proposals. Um, that is that's a clear trend and it's not going to change uh, in the coming season. Um, second, within environmental proposals, the focus on climate um, will continue and it will increase uh, given, given the SEC's climate proposals. I would expect more proposals around voluntary adoption of transition plans, scenario analysis, targets and goals, none of which is mandated by the new proposal. But if you do it, you'll be required to disclose against it in the new proposal. So you're going to see sort of hand, uh, hand and glove type proposals that will align with, with the SEC's uh, disclosure framework. Um, proponents are going to continue to be tempted to get too granular and too prescriptive. Um, the SEC's uh, clearly changing uh, perspective on no action requests, which is reflected in the staff legal bulletin, which is reflected in the proposed changes to 1488, um, will amplify granularity and they will do it in environmental proposals. 
um, notwithstanding the policy statements and voting records of some of our most um, significant institutional investors, um, the proponents will still be tempted and they will do it. Uh, and you will see proposals that are more granular. I think you're gonna see multiple proposals on the same topic. And I definitely think you're going to see dialogue dialogue year over year with respect to um, shareholder proposals in this area. You already saw it. Once you get one, you're going to get another one, whether or not it passed, um, but then they will be related. All of that comes together. And it's like, I don't know what's gonna happen with shareholder voting patterns. Uh, it, it's clear that some of the procedural changes that um, this SEC has, has enacted are designed in part to, uh, I guess, hold institutional investors accountable for their votes in this area. And therefore, there may be some pressure on institutional investors to align more closely to their stated policies and to have policies that unlike, for example, Black Rocks are not case by case. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are in the midst of a global energy crisis. Um, we have seen uh, shareholder reaction uh, to, um, to proposals that are too granular. And so maybe you won't, um, maybe you won't uh, see that. Um, someone asked me to repeat what I thought um, they would focus on. I think the focus is on targets and goals, which you already have, transition plans, and also I think scenario analysis. If I were, uh, uh, if I were a proponent and I knew my proposal wasn't going to get boxed out by the SEC and I really want to see it in your box and they don't want to negotiate with you, scenario analysis is what I would ask for. Um, so hopefully I'm wrong about that. Uh, again, not specific to environmental, but you also need to think about um, the continued use of exempt solicitations. Uh, we saw those in record number this year. Again, another thing that increased by more than a third. Um, there's just a real uh, desire to have dialogue with companies and with each other and with other shareholders around this and the exempt solicitation is one way uh, to do it. Um, and, you know, I know as we're about to stop talking about regular 14-8 uh, proposals, I guess we could talk about compensation proposals uh, next real quick. Mark, before um, you go to that, let me put you on the spot with a question that we did not rehearse in advance. Um, so sorry for that. But, you know, one question I think some issuers are facing is whether um, there's any benefit or detriment to continuing to do shareholder meetings as virtual meetings in light of some of this activity around shareholder proposals. And in particular, given the interest that some of the states have taken in ESG or anti-ESG related topics, is there a pro or a con that people should be bearing in mind? Or are you pretty neutral on virtual versus in-person versus hybrid meetings at this point? Um, look, uh, you've been practicing for 20 something years. I've been practicing for 30 something years. And so perhaps uh, I'm biased about this, but um, my view is that in-person annual meetings, I think people have, you know, over the past couple of years appreciated that uh, they are, uh, you know, in, in an environment where people want to have a dialogue, it's more personal. It's more focused on actual investors. It requires a higher investment, no pun intended, in order to engage in that dialogue with an issuer. Um, so I like that. That doesn't mean I haven't forgotten what happened in 2008 and 2009 around shareholder meetings and having people actually um, you know, boycott or attend meetings. Uh, but uh, I, I think in this environment uh, where everything is recorded, and taped and broadcast, uh, having having an in-person meeting probably is the better part of, of valor. 
Thank you. And while you were speaking, we did get a couple follow-up questions on exempt solicitations. So your comment there seems to have garnered a lot of interest. I think um, the questions kind of circle around the question of how seriously should issuers take exempt solicitations? Do they need to react to them? Can they ignore them? How effective are exempt solicitations? Can you speak to that a little bit more as well? Sure. And I think this is also a good time to think about for the two of you, because I have a couple of of points and we've been very disciplined um so there's lots to talk about we actually have a little time to do this which i'm, I'm really excited about um any uh sort of practical tidbits from your experience over the past season that you want to share now before we hit um compensation proposals and comp uh but uh, with respect to exempt solicitations i think the answer is there haven't been that effective um but uh, there's they are much more hostile uh, and because it's a free writing environment, as opposed to being limited by the um, by the rules of 14A8, and even and even then, you know, also having some SEC review over the types of statements you make in your proposal has limited that kind of dialogue. While the exempt solicitation is is sort of all anything goes, and um, the issue with that is twofold: it's fun to read. Um, and uh, issues are tempted to respond. So my advice for you is you should know it's you should know it's out there. So your management or your board doesn't surprise you with what is this thing that I just saw. Um, and you should be ready to tell them that unless there's something in there that an actual institutional investor is going to vote on, I would not. I you know I personally. Don't think it's helpful to respond to them directly in any way, and, and I, I, you know, outside of an actual proxy contest type situation, I think I think going tit for tat with a shareholder is not. Um, it, it's it's hard to be successful. Uh, so, with respect to practical pointers, I, I had two um, that were raised in in um, in your discussion, Melissa. The first was with respect to special meeting thresholds. You know, we noted that um, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, uh, right? You know, shelter proponents are like 30% is too high. Uh, companies are like 10% is too low because you know one or maybe two or two of four could call a special meeting, which I think is a pretty uh, powerful argument and true for many many large issuers given the size of Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. And if you have one other large holder, any any mix or match of that is easily going to get you above ten percent. Um, so I think uh, I think the other thing, if you're responding to a proposal like that with ISS or real shareholders or in your proxy statement, is to think about the number of holders it takes to get to your existing threshold. Because I think it's also just as powerful to say, "Hey, this one's too low, but my twenty to twenty-five is just right," and here's the reason. Because here are the number of shareholders that it would take to get together, and they can do it, and, and they're significant. So it's not too high that, that it's out of bounds for them. Um, so it's just something very specific to your own shareholder base that you can think about uh, responding to. Uh, the, the, the second is around the, the clear increase in civil rights uh, and racial equity audits. Both the, both that is destined to continue. It, it is driven by factors, you know, outside of the public company space. Uh, um, that is uh, like very, there's a wide variety of those types of audits, and I think some uh, issuers have been successful in negotiating those out by focusing on um, an audit that is in a defined area or business because it's doable. Uh, it's something you can actually report on. It, it may actually support your business as opposed to something that is undefined. Um, you know, now that we've had these, like we're about to, to see what these audits look like. And I think that's going to be a whole different uh, give and take for public companies who are undertaking those. Well, I'll add a couple practical tips to the mix too. Um, one is really obvious, but I'll say it anyway. You got to work with your proxy solicitor on these proposals. 
you can end up with some surprising results. I've worked with companies, for example, that have more European asset managers in their shareholder composition, and that can impact shareholder appetite for things like environmental proposals. And the answer at a company with that shareholder base may be different than the answer for a company that has more US asset managers and its shareholders, for example. And so making sure you know who's voting which way and who's in your stock at any given time is so important as you evaluate whether to seek a withdrawal or send something to a vote. And that also helps you to be able to preview for your NOM and Gov committee and your management team what to expect the outcomes will be. The other practical pointer I wanted to mention is that many of the proponents have become much more sophisticated about using the media as part of the overall arc of their um, proposal um, efforts in the spring. And this is sort of building on Mark's point about how it's difficult to win in a tit for tat and exempt solicitations. Some of these proponents have been very um, successful at attracting media attention to efforts to exclude their proposals um, using no action relief processes. Um, some of them now are also in connection with withdrawals um, asking for the right to present a video or to make a substantive presentation at the shareholder meeting as a condition of withdrawing their proposal, which of course gives them a platform to advocate for their area of interest. And so I just, I, I don't know what the right answer is for every single company. I think it probably varies from case to case, but you should know that the media attention and investor attention to the 14A8 process is growing and that it's not easy to keep things quiet. Um, if that's a goal, um, that's something to think about in terms of how you handle withdrawals. June, do you have anything or we can spend two minutes on compensation proposals and say on pay and round this out. I'll just say one thing, which is to make sure that as you're approaching the next year, you're re reviewing your disclosures in, in particular on ESG related issues, to make sure that you're communicating across the various departments, because as Mark is talking about the disclosure of your civil rights audits, um, and those are being conducted, your disclosure of your ESG targets and goals or, or plans, those are now going to have impacts not only under the SEC's um, proposed rulemaking, but also under various state legislative efforts. And so making sure the different parts of your legal department, IR, PR departments are, are communicating um, effectively is going to be more important than ever. That's a good point. Thank you for that. Um, so if we just look at compensation proposals, this is, you know, a sleepy area of the 14A8 world. Um, this year it got a little less uh, sleepy. We had decade high support, um, you know, in particular in the area of, of severance where, where three proposals passed. Um, you saw a real jump there, I think because one proposal passed there, um, you know, one of two passed there last year. And so perhaps you're going to see more probably at companies that have had a recent exit with a meaningful severance of them. Um, so that's, um, that's not good news. Um, I think if you look at say on pay, um, as well, uh, you know, at, at one level, it's it's same old, same old. If you look at 22 to 21, it doesn't seem that much different. You know, we had the opportunity to look back 10 years, and there is a difference. Um, and it, it surprised me. Um, you know, the first is way more big companies fail, say, on pay now. So just if you go back five years, only two S&P 500 companies failed in 2017, um, seven increased in 2018 to 18 in the first half of 2022, 19 right now. That's just, um, I mean, still a small proportion of the S&P 500, but it's a lot more. Um, if you look at um, just like the next uh, slide for my one minute, um, if you look at uh, the support numbers, um, you know, what's what's interesting is when ISS uh, is in favor, the support continues to be pretty steady. 
at 92%, which is only slightly down from 94% five years ago. On the other hand, um, when ISS is negative, the average level of support is 54%. Um, five years ago, it was 69%. And that is sort of where the 70% concept came from. Um, the difference between 69 and 54% is huge. But that is a, that is a big difference. Um, and it seems destined to become more correlated um, year over year. And um, the effect, even for companies uh, that don't have a negative ISS recommendation, um, is you just have a steadily decreasing level of companies that achieve 90 plus percent in the S&P 500. Like that would used to be something you could take for granted um, unless you got a negative ISS recommendation. And at, at this point, um, only two thirds of the S&P 500 this season achieved the 90 plus percent threshold. Uh, and it, I, I think it, it is another uh, symptom of, of how uh, the annual meeting is being used to engage with dialogue with investors, probably not around uh, major items, but more around other areas of disagreement or just stock performance generally. Uh, so, so not much good news as you enter the, um, the 2023 season. Uh, we do have a lot of resources on our, um, on our website uh, with respect to this uh, that you can access the slides we will make available, I believe on the website, but if it's not on the website, we'll definitely email them to you. Um, I got one question uh, with respect to Glass-Lewis uh, and the Glass-Lewis impact. And I don't mean, um, I don't mean to slight Glass-Lewis, but it's really a mixed it's really a mixed bag with respect to Glass Lewis because it's sort of a modifier, I think, on how ISS is coming out with it. Um, because I think a positive ISS recommendation and a negative one, um, a negative from Glass Lewis, uh, is not as meaningful as two negatives. I think if you have two negatives, you can see another seven, eight percent as a result of Glass Lewis's negative recommendation. And with 54% on average, now you're really fighting to be above 50%. And it's just much, much harder than it used to be um, to achieve that. And they're all advisory votes, but I think everyone knows much better to get a C than an F. Um, thank you, uh, June. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.